Good morning. Welcome to Orange Coast Unitarian Universalist Church. My name is Wendy and I am your intern minister and also your worship associate today. I am, thank you. It's my first time as worship associate. So I am joined by Reverend Sean Wilcher, our minister, and Karen Magoon Pearson, who is our director of religious education for children and youth, and Steve Morihiro and Susan Shaw, who are leading our music this morning. <laughs> Keep your clapping hands at the ready because we have a special person we would like to introduce to you today and welcome to this community. And here is Reverend Sean to tell you all about that. Okay, the moment y'all have been waiting for, right? No. So we have a new director of music ministries. Now he wasn't able to make the choir on Thursday, so he's not leading music today. That is uh, Steve and Susan's uh, last day of doing that, at least officially as co-director of music ministry. But he's excited to be with us, and he's singing in our choir this morning. So I'm pleased to introduce to you. <laughs> This is Jacob, Jacob Sweatland, and you notice he has now up there. So it's our new director of music ministries. <laughs> You'll have a chance to uh, chat with Jacob after the service because, of course, what do we have? Cake. cake. Of course we have cake to celebrate this new era in the life of our congregation. And uh, so you we're very excited to have Jacob here with us, and I'm really looking forward to, to seeing how this uh, merges with all of our wonderful worship on Sunday morning. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it back over to Wendy. Welcome. We welcome all this morning. We would also like to recognize the many volunteers that have helped put this service together today. And we respectfully recognize that our church property rests on the Hitcherman and Tongva land. As Unitarian Universalists, we have many different beliefs, but we are one loving community bound together not by a common set of rules or beliefs, but rather a covenant. A covenant is a promise, a promise that whatever our beliefs, we'll accept one another and encourage each other in spiritual growth. We affirm that all life has inherent value and that all existence is interconnected. We strive for justice and compassion in our deeds and relationships. We are committed to creating a welcoming community without regard to the traits that sometimes divide people. Okay, so rumors, we invite you to silence your cell phones. And for Zoomers, we invite you to say hello in the chat, hi. Hi. <laughs> I want to also extend a very special welcome to visitors. If you're seeking a spiritual home, you, we hope that you'll find it here. And later in the service, we'll have an opportunity for you to introduce yourself if you would like to. So we begin our worship today with the lighting of our chalice. Hello. And <laughs> it's always good to have a partner. We would like to invite some returning congregants to the service today to light our chalice. Mara, Andres, and Vivi won the award yesterday for the farthest travel <laughs> to get to Reverend Sean's celebration yesterday. So welcome back. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. To dwell together in peace, to seek truth and love, and to help one another. This we affirm together. Thank you so much. Please join us in singing our opening song today.
So imagine for a moment, I invite you to imagine this, that our lives are like links in a chain, right? We're all linked. Each of us is a distinct link, and we form a kind of unbroken chain of human existence, sort of crisscrossing with one another, forming bonds that support and hold us. And it is our actions, our values, and our love that form the strength of this chain, constructed by countless acts of compassion, generosity, and justice. And each time we do one of these actions, we strengthen the link of those chains. We fortify the connection between generations and communities. In this, we bind ourselves to both to the past, but also we propel ourselves into the future. Let us remember that all that we do in our lives, all that we do here in this church, are part of a chain of legacies that began with our ancestors and continue as a gift from us to all that will follow. So come, let us build that unbroken chain of love. Let us worship together. Sing of their dreams of a new day in the sun. Some sing out for love, and some sing just for fun. In the circle of song, we are one. Come join with me in the circle of song, young and the old, the weak and the strong. Singing with one voice, though we may speak different tongues, in the circle of song, we are one. Some sing of this land, of the country of their birth. Some sing of this land, and the beauty of the earth. Some sing of this land, and all that it is worth. In the circle of song, we are one. Come join with me in the circle of song. Young and the old, the weak and the strong, singing with one voice, though we may speak different tongues. In the circle of song, we are one. Each of us must leave this place, go back to our home. Each of us must walk a path that must be walked alone. Each of us will bear the fruit, the seeds that we have sown. In the circle of song, we are one. Come join with me in the circle of song. Young and the old, the weak and the strong, singing with one voice, though we may speak different tongues, in the circle of song, we are one. In the circle of song, we are one.
Good morning. Our story this morning is Miss Rumphius. The lupine lady lives in a small house overlooking the sea. In between the rocks around her house grow blue and purple and rose-colored flowers. The lupine lady is little and old, but she has not always been that way. I know. She is my great aunt, and she told me so. Once upon a time, she was a little girl named Alice who lived in a city by the sea. Many years ago, her grandfather had come to America on a large sailing ship. Now he worked in the shop at the bottom of the house, making figureheads for the prows of ships and carvings out of wood to put in front of cigar stores. For Alice's grandfather was an artist. He painted pictures, too, of sailing ships and places across the sea. He was very, when he was very busy, Alice helped him put in the skies. In the evening, Alice sat on her grandfather's knee and listened to his stories of faraway places. When he had finished, Alice would say, when I grow up, I too will go to faraway places. And when I grow old, I too will live beside the sea. That is all very well, little Alice, said her grandfather, but there is a third thing you must do. What is that? asked Alice. You must do something to make the world more beautiful, said her grandfather. All right, said Alice, but she did not know what that could be. In the meantime, Alice got up and washed her face and ate porridge for breakfast. She went to school and came home and did her homework. And pretty soon she was grown up. <laughs> then my great aunt Alice set out to do the three things she had told her grandfather she was going to do. She left home and went to live in another city far from the sea in the salt air. There she worked in a library, dusting books and keeping them from getting mixed up and helping people find the ones they wanted. Some of the books told her about faraway places. People called her Miss Rumphius now. Sometimes she went to the conservatory in the middle of the park. When she stepped inside on a wintry day, the warm, moist air wrapped itself around her and the sweet smell of jasmine filled her nose. This is almost like a tropical isle, said Miss Rumphius, but not quite. So Miss Rumphius went to a real tropical island she walked on long beaches, picking up beautiful shells. My great aunt, Miss Alice Rumphius, climbed tall mountains where the snow never melted. She went through jungles and across deserts. She saw lions playing and kangaroos jumping. And everywhere she made friends she would never forget. Then one day, getting off a camel, she hurt her back. What a foolish thing to do, said Miss Rumphius. Well... I have certainly seen faraway places. Maybe it is time to find my place by the sea. And it was, so she did. She started a little garden among the rocks that surrounded her house, and she planted a few flower seeds in the stony ground. Miss Rumphius was almost perfectly happy. But there's still one more thing I have to do, she said. I have to do something to make the world more beautiful. But what? The next spring, Miss Rumphius was not very well. Her back was bothering her again, and she had to stay in bed most of the time. The flowers she had planted the summer before had come up and bloomed in spite of the stony ground. She could see them from her bedroom window, blue and purple and rose-colored. Lupines, said Miss Rumphius with satisfaction. I've always loved lupines the best. I wish I could plant more seeds this summer so that I could have still more flowers next year but she wasn't able to. After a hard winter, spring came again. Miss Rumphius was feeling much better. One afternoon, she started to walk up and over the hill where she had not been for a long time. I don't believe my eyes, she cried when she got to the top. For there, on the other side of the hill, was a large patch of blue and purple and rose-colored lupines. It was the wind, she said as she knelt in delight. 
It was the wind that brought the seeds from my garden here, and the birds must have helped too. Then Miss Rumphius had a wonderful idea. She hurried home and got out her seed catalogs. She sent off to the very best seed house for five bushels of lupine seed. <laughs> it's a lot, yeah. <laughs> Gardening people say that's a lot. All that summer, Miss Rumphius, her pockets full of seeds, wandered over fields and headlands sowing lupines. She scattered seeds along the highways and down the country lanes. She flung handfuls of them around the schoolhouse and back of the church. She tossed them into hollows and along stone walls. Now some people called her that crazy old lady. <laughs> the next spring there were lupines everywhere. Fields and hillsides were covered with blue and purple and rose-colored flowers. They bloomed along the highways and down the lanes. Bright patches lay around the schoolhouse and back of the church. Down in the hollows and along the stone walls grew the beautiful flowers. <clears throat> Miss Rumphius had done the third, the most difficult thing of all. My great aunt, Alice, Miss Rumphius, is very old now. <clears throat> Her hair is very white. Every year there are more and more <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> lupines. Now they call her the lupine lady. When I grow up, I tell her, I too will go to faraway places and come home to live by the sea. That is all very well, little Alice, says my aunt. But there's a third thing you must do. What's that, I ask. You must do something to make the world more beautiful. All right, I say, but I do not know yet what that can be. I'm going to light our children's chalice, and then we're going to sing our children and youth and their teachers out to our religious education classes. Your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse the world. The mind's power, the strength of the hands, the reaches of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, waiting. Any of these can serve to feed the hungry or bind up wounds, welcome the stranger, praise what is sacred, do the work of justice, or offer love. Any of these can draw down the prison door, hoard bread, abandon the poor, obscure what is holy, comply with injustice, or withhold love. You must answer this question. What will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless the world. The choice to bless the world is more than an act of will, a moving forward into the world with the intention to do good. It is an act of recognition, a confession of surprise, a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of a broken world, unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. And while there's injustice, indifference, or evil, there moves a holy disturbance a benevolent rage, a revolutionary love protesting, urging, insisting that what is sacred will not be defiled. Those who bless the world live their life as a gesture of thanks for this beauty and this benevolent rage. The choice to bless the world will draw into community the endeavor shared, the heritage passed on, the comfort of human friendship. None of us alone can save the world. Together, 
that is another possibility waiting. Choose to bless the world, or maybe even just one person in the world. I want to tell you a story about uh, my twin sister and her family. I did not know she was going to be here today, just so you know that was a surprise from yesterday. So I'm proud of her and uh, her husband, Louis, my wonderful brother-in-law, because you see, they recently took in a homeless youth into their family. So Andrea uh, was a friend of my uh, niece, Alex, from high school. And Andrea was beloved by everybody in her class. Her mother, however, is an unhealthy person and kicked her out of the home for truly no good reason. It's a very long story. But if you think that this is, oh, just teenage stuff, no. This is someone who is essentially trying to get rid of their daughter. Despite living in a middle class area of Seattle, Andrea grew up very poor and she had almost nothing to her name when she moved in with my sister's family, literally one plastic bag of a few clothes. I remember Regan saying to me, she only has one bra. What is up with that? Only one bra. I thought it was kind of funny. Right, so Regan is uh, taking Andrea shopping for clothes and the guest bedroom is now her bedroom to decorate as she wants. Uh, she's taken her to Planned Parenthood as she is sexually active good mother, uh, and uh, attends, you know, her plays. She's in the drama and different things and attends those things in concert. And I remember uh, Regan told me that Andrea once sort of tentatively asked her, so, you know, at the drama club, there's kind of a, a parents' night. Do you, do you want to go? And Regan was like, absolutely. Here's another thing is, is that actually I'm sending uh, – a little bit of money every month to my sister to help out. My sister is definitely not poor, but neither is she rich, and I know it's a bit of a financial strain on the family, so I offered. Now, Andrea does not know this. I don't think she knows this. Does she know? No, no, she doesn't know this. Of course not. I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm doing it because I believe in Andrea's future. Uh, I want to help uh, with that future, and I want to help my sister's family, right? I did the same thing for Alex's college. I sent money. Uh, every month. I don't think Alex knows that I did that, but I believe in her future too. So when I think about, we were talking about legacy, I want to think like, you know, what kind of legacy is this leaving Andrea, right? As a teenager, I doubt she's aware of the finances and challenges that this brings, right? Yeah, Teenagers don't remember these things, but she will always remember the love and the support and perhaps someday she will pay it forward. And that is part of leading a legacy. Is this a legacy of financial support, of money, or of love? It's both. I mean, it's, of course, I mean, there is some financial things to this. We don't like to think that money is tied to love, but there's a reality, right, that money does help. <laughs> Sometimes money is what makes a difference in people's lives. Now, my older sister Kim over here, not by many years or anything like that. Yeah, no, no, no. no. <laughs> she, uh, she has, she's a bit like me. She has no children. Uh, she isn't married. Uh, and she's dedicated her life to her own ministry of the environment. That's her legacy. She forms links between stakeholders uh, in the environment, bringing them together so that they can build stronger chains, particularly around water issues in the West. Now, my sister is semi-retired. I don't know you can call it. Yeah, kind of, no, you know, okay. Yeah, you know. Uh, she reminds me a bit of, of Miss Rumphius, you know, like she's kind of spreading her love everywhere, making the world a more beautiful place. So I want to invite you this morning to think about where has someone helped you in your life? So this is the spirit of meditation here to just, you know, take a few deep breaths. How have you either blessed the world or who has blessed you that helps strengthen your chains? In my own life, I had this couple named Tom and Donna Cutler. Regan remembers them. 
when I was in college, I had no help from my family, and they invited me into their home. They invited both Regan and I into their homes. Uh, I remember paying rent, but it was very little. Uh, and I seem to remember they even loaned me some money. I'm thinking, did I ever pay it back? <laughs> I have no idea. They put up with my cats, and they were just incredibly loving and supportive. And I was, Regan and I were there when they got married, and I was there when Anthony, their son, was born. So who helped you become who you are? Whether it was just spending time with you or helping you monetarily. I invite you to just think about that for a minute. Who helped you or who have you helped? You know, I think that many of us kind of, we don't think of ourselves necessarily always as helpers, as someone who's made a difference in the world, but how many of you thought about the Ukrainians next door? How many people here donated bedding, pillows, cots, all sorts of stuff when we did it? How many people have donated money to help out? We made a difference in their lives of 82 people I think it's 82 people, five cats, and three dogs. <laughs> I think that's absolutely incredible. We have done amazing things in this church. So I invite you to think of all the ways that we help people, how much we ourselves have been helped as well, and all the little ways that sometimes we just don't even think about. And then when you're ready, Let's join the choir in singing. There are legacies of blessing and there are legacies of curses and right now it feels like in the world that it's burning with hatred, fear, anger, violence. There's armed conflict around the world and of course the ones that were probably on most of our mind right now is the war in Ukraine and the attack by Hamas in Israel and with the subsequent retaliation and declaration of war by Israel on Gaza and Hamas. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I have this anxiety rises in me, right? Most of us have opinions maybe on the right or the wrong of the different sides, and I'm not going to go into that right now. But instead, I want to ask you what kind of legacy is being left to the generations in Palestine and in Israel? What kind of legacy does nurturing hate leave? It seems a legacy of more violence, more war, more fear, more horror. But is that inevitable when hate is nurtured? I want to remind you that on October 12th, 1998, almost exactly 25 years ago, Matthew Shepard, a young gay man, was killed in Laramie, Wyoming. He was brutally beaten, tied to a fence, and left to die. This event could have created more legacy of hate, but instead it sparked a legacy of love. 
in the Shumpert Foundation by his parents. His parents chose to reach out to the world to tell his story, to humanize Matthew, so that such tragedies might not happen in the future. We don't know how many lives that love saved, but we do know it was a link in the chain that built more compassion, more understanding for the LGBTQ community. The perpetrators chose to curse the world. His family, even though they were angry and grief-stricken, they chose to bless the world. It is not inevitable, and we can choose to be a blessing. As our choir sang, each of us will bear the fruit of the seeds that we have sown. Each of us will bear the fruit of the seeds that we have sown. One way to choose to be a blessing is to humanize all sides of the conflict, even when one side doesn't humanize the other. In the circle of song, we are one. And if you want to be a blessing to the world, then we need to stop nurturing hatred, to respond with that kind of humaneness, humanity. It is both horrifying to watch the Israeli citizens being butchered by Hamas terrorists, and it's horrific to watch the suffering of innocent Palestinians as Israel goes in and tries to wipe out Hamas. It is not an either or. It's not about choosing sides. It's about choosing humaneness. It's about nurturing love, not hate. And believing that's not always easy. <laughs> You know, it's interesting when I think about seeing both sides and seeing the humanity on both sides of the Israeli and Palestinian conflict, I personally don't have a problem with them, with this. I think that both sides are suffering horribly, but I struggle deeply with feeling of humaneness with Russians. I do, I find it occasionally when I think about, okay, these soldiers are duped as well as the populace is. When I think about those that are afraid of their government and, and are afraid to speak out, and that helps, but this is a struggle. It feels a bit like a curse, like I'm like, hold, like okay, don't hold back that love, Sean, nurture the love. But what about you? Where do you struggle to, nurture, to not nurture hate, to try to nurture love? So again, I want to invite you into that time of meditation or contemplation to think about where do you struggle to nurture love? And when you're ready, please join the choir in singing the last two verses of this song. I feel that we as Unitarian Universalists, it is our sacred duty to nurture the dignity and worth of every person. See that word in there, every person, right? That's hard, but that's what it means to be a blessing to the world. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to nurture love in this world. You all want that? Yeah. yeah. I know. Can I can I get an amen or something here? Yeah, 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 there we go. All right, excellent. All right. Well, I've got an opportunity for you to be a great blessing to our community here. So uh, 
Saturday, November 4th is actually called Love Our Schools Day here in Costa Mesa. And that morning, a team of volunteers from this church are going to meet at Ray Elementary School to set up their robotics room, okay? So we're going to be assembling IKEA cabinets uh, that we have purchased with the plate share that we're doing this month, <laughs> right? Uh, and we're fastening Lego base plates and all sorts of fun stuff to the wall. Uh, this is one of the many ways that, that we can leave a legacy in this church, right? A legacy of love. And by the way, uh, anybody could do this work. If, if all you need to do is read directions, if you can't do a hammer, you're fine. Because you know it's IKEA, so. Um, that's always a challenge. So uh, if you want to sign up today, I believe uh, Wendy will be taking sign-ups uh, for that. Maureen uh, McConaughey has to leave directly after, but she's a great person to ask questions to about the whole project. This was her wonderful idea to do some of this. So, yes. So come out, Ray Elementary, uh, which I, if you don't aware, it's a 98% uh, people of color elementary school here, um, and they are very excited to have us involved in helping them. So there's lots of different ways of leaving legacies, and one is this is a legacy of love. Like, right? Like, are the people, are these kids ever going to remember the OCUC came and helped them? Probably not. Um, and that's okay. That's what a legacy of love does. Maybe, maybe they'll invent transporter technology. Oh yeah, I'm totally waiting for it. Okay. Oh yeah, it could happen. All right. I want to talk to you about some other ways of leaving legacies. How many of you know the names? Raise your hands. How many of you know the names Albert and Eula Daniels? There's a few people here who do, and I can tell you those are the people who've been around for a very long time. Uh, but all of you here in the room, and those of you in Zone who've been here before, uh, you're actually here because of them. This is called Daniel's Hall. This is named after Al and Eula. Um, they were one of the first people to give to our endowment fund. It was somewhere around the amount of, I think Nancy said it was like 380K. Uh, it was a huge, they didn't have any kids. They were like, okay, we're gonna leave it to the church. And that monies, those monies from the endowment, they continue to support the church. Uh, since then, we've borrowed from that endowment uh, to renovate this room, was one of the things that we used it for, uh, to pay staff salaries when we first moved here, and it turned out to be way more expensive than everybody thought, uh, and it was before we got all the rentals that really helped out and everything, uh, which was wonderful. But those monies every year go into our fund and they fund things like an intern, right? We can afford things like that, right? Uh, and new audio equipment, we've got this new uh, audio equipment back there, all sorts of things. Now, most of you probably don't know, as I raised your hand, like most of you don't know who Al and Eula Daniels uh, were because legacies are really rarely about fame, right? There'll be a plaque going up at some point. I think there's somewhere around here one of them. You might find a plaque with your name mentioned on if you were to leave a legacy. But monetary legacies we leave are not about fame as much as they are about love. This church meant the world to them, and that's why they supported it. You know, Forrest Church, who's a famous Unitarian Universalist minister, um, he was, one of the reasons why he's so famous is that he knew that he was going to die from esophageal cancer. So he wrote a book called Love and Death. And he wrote this about this. He said he wrote, about life and death, no one knows. But about this, we, are sh we surely know. There is love after death. Not only do our finest actions invest life with meaning and purpose, but they also live on after us. Two centuries from now, the last tracings of our being will yet express themselves in little works of love that follow bead by bead in a luminous chain extending from our dear ones out into the world and then on into the next, strung by our own loving hands. Death is love's measure. Not only is our grief when someone dies testimony to our love, but when we ourselves die, the love we have given to others is the one thing that death cannot kill. This is a beautiful writer. Our capital campaign that we're doing trying to build this is kind of about love after death, right? It's about love right now that will serve for future generations. 
We have an opportunity to build something that will last those generations. It's our new sanctuary. And we're so close, people. We're so close. For those of you who don't know the background, we originally, prior to COVID, had almost all the money. We were waiting for the city to give us the OK. COVID hit, then we got a rebid, and it was like, another million dollars, please. Oh my goodness. And yet we've done it. We were so close. We're like, I think 300K close. And we do need everyone, no matter how small or big, to donate so we can make that future come true. And our board, our capital campaign committee, and I ask that you give what you can. I know many of you give, some people give tons, then there's people like me who give what they can. Uh, I'm not wealthy, but I'm happy to give. Um, when, we, when we ask this, we're not asking you because, you know, like, just give us your money, right? It's because we, we want you to nurture love in the world because you believe in this church. And we do have plan to have plaques of people who donated, but chances are future generations are going to like walk by those plaques and probably not read them, right? Just like Al and Eula Daniels, you may never know. Just as Regan Lewis are doing for Andrea and as Kim does for all of our futures. I've now tripled my original pledge, and I did it because I want my love in this congregation to thrive long after I'm gone. I want to be a blessing to this world and to this church. And 50 years from now, there might be a few people remember, oh yeah, that Reverend Sean. I remember her, maybe Chance or Vivi, you know, will remember me. Jaden, maybe, I don't know. Um, but most people won't know me, but they will benefit from my love and from yours. You know, I doubt that Andrea will remember, know all of the money that my sister put forward to help her with clothing and food and health issues, but she will remember the love of this family that took her in deeply. And Ray Elementary's children may not know who set up the robotics room, but they will all benefit. And as I said, maybe they'll invent transporter technology. Still waiting. <laughs> And I'm giving what I can because I believe in you and I believe in this church. Leaving a legacy is about love after death. It's about being a blessing to the world. And I invite you to be a blessing to the world. So let us sing. Please rise and body our spirit as we sing our returning song. <laughs> Unitarian Universalist congregations are fully self-supporting, meaning that friends and members may raise all of the funds for the operating budget, ministries, and programs of the church. We are forever grateful for your gifts of time, treasure, and talent. OCUUC amplifies that spirit of generosity by sharing half the plate with an organization that shares our values. And our values are building robots <laughs> this month. You got to run before you walk, got to build a robot before you build a transporter, you know. 
There are multiple ways where you can support this church and organization. You can mail a check, or you can go to our website or use an app called Vanco Mobile. If you are a rumor, you can also use the very non-technical basket, which is coming around for you. As it's passed, the choice is yours, and all the information is on your website should you need it. And as always, thank you for your generosity. That was really beautiful. Great work as always, choir. Today we spoke about all the different ways we can leave a legacy or a love after death as it were, as many of you know, because we just talked about it and it's been going on for some time. We are so close to building our new sanctuary and we need everyone to help build this new legacy, if not just for ourselves, but for future generations. So I would love to introduce you uh, Nancy Lockery, president of our congregation, and Craig Sperry, the chair of the construction committee. They would like to say a few words about what each of us can do to help. So, when we bought this site 10 years ago, we knew we needed a sanctuary. It didn't have a good place for us. And we spent some time looking around and doing some research and realized that two-story building that the realtor told us we could just remodel for $100,000 wasn't going to work. <laughs> so, and that we really needed to start over with a new building. The, um, five years ago, we started the campaigns to start ma raising the money to do this sanctuary. It's been a long road. There's been a pandemic in the middle. and. Uh, but uh, we are getting closer. 
The, um, in February of 2021, the congregation authorized us to build it for 1.8 million. And through generous donors to date, we have almost $2 million, or we know where it can come from. You can see this out on the patio afterwards, because I know you can't read it. Um, so we've been working on this for a long time. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, imagine our surprise when we got the bids back, and instead of the 1.8 million that the congregation approved, they came in at close to 2.7, so it was like, ooh. And that was largely a result of the pandemic Nancy mentioned. We had supply chain issues and you know, the cost of metal went up, the cost of building materials went up. So we didn't let that you know, defeat us because we went back and we looked at our plan and, and took out some things that we, we could and then tried and lower the price. But it comes down to the, the fact that it was a higher price because the city required us to do things that we didn't know initially. We had to put in fire sprinklers, and we, all, we also had to bring in a new water main for close to $100,000, which, you know, it's unfortunate, but I think we still want this new sanctuary. So I might mention that the construction committee is Nancy, uh, Barbara Morihiro, and I don't know if Deborah Quam and Audrey Prosser are online and if Bob Lushen is, line, but th or is online with Zoom, but those are the other members that make up our committee. And thank you. You know, usually when you, you join a committee, it's like, okay, it's a, it's a one-year gig, you know, maybe two, <laughs> maybe two years, well, five years, and, and we're still going, but we're still committed. In fact, when we knew that we needed an additional 700,000, which is there, the committee itself, the sanctuary committee and their families had pledged 370,000 to reach that's 700,000 gold. So we're asking, yeah, thank you. So we're asking the congregation to match us, to please you know, dig deep, because we're, we're this close. Like they've said, we, we really want to see this come through. So we will have a table on the courtyard after the service. We will have pledge forms. So we're asking everyone to, uh, to consider what the, what the service is today, a legacy of blessings. So this, this would be a, a legacy of a blessing for people to come through. Thank you. Okay. So this is not a typical fundraise with a pledge dinner. We'll have to wait for the groundbreaking celebration for the party. <laughs> but so it's just, you know what to do. The sanctuary committee has done what they can. We're so close. Um, the payment won't need to be made until spring of 2024. That's about, the, we have a lot of money in the bank, uh, but so we can get going, but we'll need to know that, it, we need to promises right now to know that we will be getting it. So you know what to do. It's time to step up and make it happen. We can have our sanctuary and leave a legacy for ourselves and you use to come. We can do this hard thing. It's all up to you. Please join us in standing up and singing in mind, body, or spirit. We gather together a song that puts our intentions into words and expresses our gratitude for the many gifts we share. <laughs> Of course, now is that time when we in, uh, honor the important events and people in our lives. This is a weekly ritual that we have called Joys and Sorrows, and everyone is invited. If you're a member, friend, visitor, everyone can do this. And the, the basically the idea is, uh, is if you're holding something that, close to your heart, moments from the last days or weeks or hours, something that struck you at your core, and if you'd like to honor that, you may come forward and light a candle. And I would like to invite uh, Marilyn Giss, our uh, congregational nurse and part of the pastoral care team, uh, to help with that. So if you're a roomer, you're invited to come forward to light your candle. And if you'd like to share your joy or sorrow, you can write it on a slip of paper that the ushers have here and are happy to give you if you didn't pick one up when you came in. 
And once the rumors uh, are done, we'll, we'll uh, done lighting their candles and we'll read them out loud. And Zoomers, you're invited to write your joy or sour in the chat. I've got my phone all hooked up and everything to be able to read those out loud. Uh, and Marilyn will then uh, light a candle for you. And of course, everyone, if you would simply like to write a candle and you don't have to write anything out, you just sit forward and come forward and light a candle. Uh, Zoomers, if you just want a candle lit, you can say, please light a candle for me and we'll do that for you. So as music is played, I invite you to silently offering healing or celebration as you feel called and according to your own beliefs. Please come forward. All right, online, hello, Zoomers. Um, I wanna um, point out, by the way, the Zoomers can all see us here, and as you're leaving the sanctuary, you might like wave hello to all of our wonderful Zoomers. We usually have 25 to 30 people online. So, you can say, yeah, it's a wonderful thing that we have. So Linda C., she wrote uh, that uh, she would like a candle of concern she says, we're deeply concerned about our 18-year-old granddaughter, Samantha, who is in the hospital instead of her first year at college at the University of Hawaii, Hawaii with a severe undiagnosed infection. Oh, Linda. Oh, my goodness. Um, 
Valerie A, on the health side, here's some good news. Valerie A says that her bone marrow biopsy came back clean. Yay. Yay. And Peggy P, she wrote, okay, you're going to make me read this right. She says, thank you, Reverend Sean, for the 10 years and counting, and to everyone who assisted with the anniversary party yesterday. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, we, had, we were celebrating 10 years of our shared ministry last night. Um, let's see here. And then Phyllis D, she says that she would like a candle of love and gratitude for Sharon L, whose act of kindness in a moment of need meant so much to me. That's very much like Sharon L. And uh, Sarah J, our administrator, she uh, would like a candle lit of gratitude. She says her son's wallet, keys, and car were stolen from his job. She says, I'm grateful that the car was recovered with moderate body damage from the failed high-speed pursuit, but mostly grateful that no one was hurt. It is, after all, just a car. Amen, that nobody was hurt. She had an app that they could track where her car was, where the car was. I mean, that's pretty cool. I'm going to get that one. All right. I've got a bunch of, boy, look at this. There's like a booklet today. I love it. Okay. Um, so Ralph Haller, bless you, honey. Um, she said, or he says, so Ralph is online. I know Ralph is up there. He says, my joy at celebrating Reverend Sean's 10 years as our minister and appreciation for all her counseling of our members in distress. Thank you, Ralph. And Sarah H. Uh, lit a candle of joy. She says, thank you to everyone who made the celebration last night for uh, Reverend Sean a wonderful success. So glad I was here. I'm glad you were here too, Sarah. She came from Georgia. Yeehaw. Let's see here. And uh, my, uh, see, it's anonymous. I wonder who. It might be my older sister, much older. <laughs> she says, such happiness for my beautiful younger sister who has found her, uh, help her, her what path? Heart path, my heart path. Thank you, sorry. I can read Shirley's handwriting, but not my own sister's, I'm telling you. Um, so uh, Judith S. says she wants to thank, uh, have a thank you to Susan Shaw for her depictions of Sean's favorite things on the celebration of the Order of Service, which I saw that was really cool. I was like, I was wondering who did that little flower and it had things of all my favorite things on it. That was so awesome. And Dave Carlson, uh, he lit a candle of zeal. I love this. He, uh, so, you know, Dave is so proud of his son, another minister in Kenosha, Wisconsin. She said, he said, this morning at 8, I watched the service from my son's church in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I am in uh, a second service today right here. These two incredible services remind me of why I am an evangelical Unitarian Universalist. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. And Sarah C. lets us know that she has a coming birthday in two weeks. She loves to sing uh, and artwork and fashion. So thank you for letting us know, Sarah. Right on. And you know, we got a choir you can sing in, just saying. Um, Heidi also lit a candle of joy. She says, for returning back to the church after several years, I'm so happy to be able to become a member again. Yay, Yay Heidi! <laughs> I think we, Heidi has a daughter we get to get to know too, yes. <laughs> and uh, Elizabeth K, uh, she says, you know, talking, she lit a candle of legacy. She said, they say a teacher never fully knows their impact on a child's life. She says, I would like to reserve that and say that my students have indeed touched my life in ways they will never fully understand. So it goes both ways and I feel, it's reversed. Oh. Okay, I would like to reverse that and say that my students have indeed touched my life in ways they will never fully understand. It goes both ways, and I truly feel blessed. Awesome. And Shirley T., she lit a candle of joy because she had a wonderful weekend last weekend at Camp de Beneville, and she wants to say thanks to the Lockrees for the transportation. 
All right, um, Craig P. He lit a candle of hope, a hope, a candle of hope for peace and healing in Ukraine and in the Middle East. Amen. And Karen R, she uh, lit a candle of sorrow. She says, my grandson, after telling a classmate that he is Jewish, was told that he killed Christ. I was told that 70 years ago, and my daughter was told that 40 years ago, and now my grandson. When will it end? <sighs> And Meg, uh, Meg W, she is um, <clears throat> at a candle of healing thoughts. She said, sending hugs and healing thoughts for Donna M, who just had spinal surgery, our wonderful Donna here. Um, please reach out to Donna. Oh, I forgot, she needs food. Oh, Donna, I'm so sorry. I know she's probably listening online. So uh, if you would like to contact Donna and say, what kind of food would you like? She would like to have some support around food uh, for the recovery of her surgery. And she does not have any uh, issues with allergies or type of food. So uh, please bring your casseroles, your chicken dishes, whatever they are, uh, to Donna. Reach out to her with that. So thank you. And that's my bad. I meant to organize that ahead of time. It's been a little busy. Sorry. Um, Lori K. Uh, lit a candle of hope. She says, um, a hopeful thoughts for her friend Judy, whose three cousins live in Israel. And the last two, I have some sad news, particularly for those of you who have been here for a very long time. Um, many of you know uh, the name Liz Phibbs. Um, and Liz unfortunately passed away at age 96. Uh, on Friday, she lived a long, full life. She hasn't been able to be a part of this congregation for a long time. She's a member of emer what we call a member emerita, is someone who can't be here and active, but will always be in our hearts. So um, please light a candle, and we hold her, her five children in our hearts, and I will let you know uh, when there will be a memorial service if the family chooses to have it here. But I think we were her only church, so we feel bl very blessed to have known uh, Liz. So. Oh, let's take a deep breath. <sighs> Let us hold in love all of these joys and sorrows, all these celebrations and hurts, both spoken and silent. Let our joys remind us to be thankful, our concerns remind us to hope, and let our sorrows remind us to connect. Because in all of these moments, we are not alone. Please join Marilyn in a spirit of prayer. This is from my prayer for children by Ina Hughes. We pray for children who sneak popsicles before supper, who erase holes in math workbooks, who can never find their shoes. And we pray for those who never get dessert, who can't find any bread to steal, who don't have any rooms to clean up, whose monsters are real. We pray for children who spend all their allowance before Tuesday, who love ghost stories and get visits from the tooth fairy, who squirm in church and scream in the phone, whose tears we sometimes laugh at and whose smiles can make us cry. And we pray for those whose nightmares come in the daytime, who have never seen a dentist, who aren't spoiled by anyone, who go to bed hungry and cry themselves to sleep. We pray for the children who want to be carried and for those who must, and for those we never give up on and for those who don't get a second chance, for those we smother and for those who will grab the hand of anybody kind enough to offer it. We pray for the children. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are a congregation made up of people who all believe differently. And yet together, when we gather, whether it's in this room or over Zoom, we make up one loving community. We need not think alike to love alike. 
If you are a guest or a visitor or someone who has not been known to us yet, I invite you to be part of this beloved community. We encourage you to either write in the chat if you're a Zoomer or if you're a Roomer to stand for a brief moment and tell us your name and where you are from. And Steve is coming around with a microphone if anyone would like to introduce themselves. be put on the spot here. <coughs> uh, my name is John, and this is my husband, Carter. And uh, we have just moved here from Napa. Uh, we've mm. been here almost two weeks. And uh, it's been really great to know that we have a community very close by. We've walked here uh, from our house. And uh, we're here. Carter uh, got a great job in Newport Beach in the uh, treatment facility world. So talk about leaving a legacy. He's helping. Uh, those that are uh, seeking help with drug and alcohol treatment. Uh, and on a personal note, he and I are both in recovery, uh, and uh, we're just happy to be here. Thank you. And, and, and John sings tenor. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Heidi. Hi, uh, I'm happy to be back here. Uh, the last time I was here, I was very heavily pregnant with someone that you might guess uh, might be in the near vicinity. <laughs> this is my daughter, Lenka. She's four. Um, between the last time I was here, I also had another child during pandemic baby. Um, so I'm very excited to be back here at this congregation and to see you again. And congratulations on 10 years. And it, yeah, just very, very thrilled to be back here. I grew up in a Unitarian church in Houston, have lots of warm memories there, and it's just wonderful to be a part of a community again. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Hi again, uh, my name is Mara. This is my husband, Andres. Our daughter Vivi is, um, well, I was pregnant with her last time I was here, and she's now almost three and a half. I wanted to say thank you so much to everyone for being so welcoming, Reverend Sean and Nancy and Tom for inviting us into their homes right now, and we are so grateful to be here, and we love you all so much. I figured I should do like a little plug about myself first. <laughs> so my name is Jacob Swetlin. I am the new director of music ministries here at the church. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just recently graduated in May from Cal State Fullerton with my bachelor's in arts uh, in choral music education and a minor in African American studies. And so talking about leaving a legacy, my, I promote to all the choirs that I conduct um, that I program music from diverse from compo from composers of diverse backgrounds. So my goal throughout my tenure here is to um, bring you know spirituals to bring life to women composers, BIPOC composers, gay and lesbian composers, because that is something that's very near and dear to my heart. So you'll be hearing a lot of music from that. Um, I conduct a community choir in Irvine. So if you ever if you want to sing here and if you want to sing in Irvine, um, just let me know. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, that's, that's a little bit about me. I, this is my first uh, what I call big boy job after college. And so um, I'm just excited to be here. So you'll see me out in the courtyard shaking hands. So come by, say hi. I'm super nice, I promise. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to let my family get away with not being introduced. For those of you who don't know, so I like uh, my... my uh, only slightly older sister to stand, and my twin and my brother-in-law. So this is Regan, who everybody thinks is me. This is Lewis, my brother-in-law, who's awesome. And uh, my, my sister Kim over here. So, yeah. so for those of you who don't know, I did not know that they were going to be arriving last night. I was completely surprised. Um, so and feeling very, very blessed after last night with all of the love that I had there. So, uh, all right, so I think that you have something more to say and then we'll, 
I do. I'm just going to bring it home here. Uh-huh. Yes. That's what we're doing. <laughs> so where is my extinguished gels? Oh, there we are. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. If you'd like to know more about our church, including programming for youth and children, please contact us at hello at, UUC, at ocuc.org, and we will help you get connected. In addition, we invite you to sign up for our weekly emails, but at this time, we are going to extinguish our chalice. Uh, let us join together as we extinguish the flame. We extinguish our chalice when not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I'll jump in here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll let you. I'm teaching my intern how to roll with the punches. Yeah. I meant to do that. So here's the, you saw all the wonderful emails that we have there. So there's a couple of bunch of things. So capital campaign, there's going to be uh, somebody out there. If you would like to pledge, please do so. Uh, there's also, we have this auction coming up, this wonderful auction. And the lady with the hat, with the Snoopy hat on it, is the one to talk to. People donate different items. I'm going to be talking about the Hebrides, and we're going to have gin and tonic and tablets. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I want to say thank you all so much for last night. Like, that meant so much to me. I can't even begin to tell you I couldn't sleep last night because I was just so full. My heart was so full. I was just lying in bed like, I can't believe this is so amazing. I love this congregation. <laughs> I love you all so much. And thank you for everybody who made it happen. Uh, you know, there are people behind this, you know, Reverend Judy did a lot, I know, and uh, Deborah did the, the lovely scarf and the bracelet, and, uh, you know, everybody was pitching in. Meg, I know, was probably running around uh, making sure everything was organized and music, uh, you know, the Bonas family, so amazing. If I miss somebody, I'm sorry. I'm still so very overwhelmed by that. Um, I did want to say also that uh, this is a great time to join the choir. Okay? Yeah. In one of my first congregations, uh, literally it was a small little fellowship, so there was like maybe 50 of us, and whenever the choir got up to sing, it was like half the congregation, right? I'm okay with that happening here. Okay, so we can make that whole area the choir if we want to, right? So we can move the piano this way, whatever. Uh, so, exactly, and, and that's yeah. Until we build a sanctuary where we have plenty of room for the choir. But I, one of the things that was interesting about doing the search for the director of music ministries was that I learned that you don't have to know how to sing. You don't have to have any experience to join the choir. I thought maybe you did. I did. I know nothing about singing music. I found out, as a matter of fact, Steve told me, oh, you're an alto. We figured out I was an alto. I had no idea. Never in my life have I known that. <laughs> now I know. Um, this is a great time to join because uh, Jacob really doesn't know who's good and who's not. So, <laughs> you know, uh, this would be a great time if you've ever had an inkling to want to join the choir, now is the time. There's only two things that you need to be able to do. One is match pitch, which means that if they plunk on the piano, can you match that pitch, which is actually really quite easy to do and probably like 95% of the population can do it. And then you need to be able to follow directions, which I know is the harder of the two, okay? <laughs> But I, I, I believe in you. You can do this. So I really want to encourage you. Talk to Jacob, uh, and we're going to be kind of pumping this up. So, and of course, we have cake, right today. So, all right. My last words to ours: Choose to bless the world because you are a blessing for me and for this church. Thank you all. Let us sing our benediction. Let us go out.
let our service continue.